What's up, RCBC? I'll tell you what's not up, the temperature. <laughs> Holy moly, man. I think the, I think the Flor state of Florida forgot we live in the sunshine state, man. Holy cow, man. Woo. All right, so what's going on, man? Everything going good? Everybody all right? Contain your excitement. Calm down. Calm down. All right, man. So we got some announcements to make. World famous type one each. The first one is check out Frankie, man. He's got glasses. He, he blamed him not being able to see why his jokes were that bad. We'll see. Like, I couldn't really see him. All right, man. So. <laughs> Woo. Again, only at Biker Church can you heckle the pastor or be heckled by the pastor. Whatever, man. We're good. We're good. So um, I was going to keep the heat off in here and try to encourage everybody to go over to the thrift shop to buy leather jackets and chaps, kind of a, like a marketing ploy and stuff, but Frankie decided to turn on the heat. So. But anyways, if you happen to be in the market for chaps or leathers or whatever, we got a pretty good selection over there. So um, the thrift shop uh, is open from Wednesday to Friday from 12 to 5. And uh, we've been having some pretty good successes and volunteers and stuff like that. So I encourage you to help spread the word at least, right? If not, go over there and buy some stuff. Uh, let's see here. Tomorrow, tomorrow Sunday. That's usually when we rock and roll and we do something amazing in the community. We're off. We're off tomorrow. So, yes, it's one of those odd months where we actually have two weekends off on a Sunday. So it's the fifth Sunday of the month, which we don't have anything scheduled. And the first Sunday of the month, we don't typically have things scheduled. So enjoy your time off. But you know what? Do something productive. Go out to another church, volunteer somewhere. I don't know, sleep in, get your energy going so you can, you know, could watch playoff games. How are the Cowboys doing? <laughs> he suck. All right, so, <laughs> all right, man, so moving along, getting out of that rabbit hole, um, next weekend, nothing covered that, so last weekend we did the world famous pancake breakfast, right, the RCBC world famous pancake breakfast, and we had a pretty good turnout, man, and it was actually for two people, one individual who we were doing a fundraiser for. Uh, he was out of work for quite a while. Um, he's a, a, a local guy, got hit on his bike on his way to work, was laid up for about three months, is actually just going back to work, and he's working, uh, I think, three days. He's trying to ease back into things, but we were able to do it for him. And being that we didn't do one in December, we combined two people. And another gentleman, uh, his name was Austin Johnson, and uh, unfortunately... We, st we actually started the fundraiser while he was in the hospital, but unfortunately he passed away due to COVID. Um, but we were able to raise $1,400 last weekend uh, for those people. So that's pretty cool, right? So, you know, it's, it's Redemption Community Biker Church, right? And the community just doesn't stop in Holly Hill or Daytona Beach or Volusia County, right? It's the biker community, and it's the community at, at, in, at, in general, right? Uh, and it was really nice to be able to sit there and do that and be able to, you know, send a check out to New Jersey and send a check to somebody locally and help them. Uh, and, and RCBC's been doing this pretty continuously. And, um, you, you know, there's people out there that look at RCBC as a great example of what other churches should be. And I'm not knocking any other churches because they, they're on their own program, right? But I do think that's pretty cool that people look at RCBC and RCBC 
has inspired, and I know this for a fact, has inspired other people and churches into action. And that's pretty cool, man. So uh, I think we just keep being true to what God's put on our heart, and, and we just keep doing it. And, um, you know, hopefully when we cross that finish line, uh, maybe we'll get a, a job well done, right? So the what? The raffle. <laughs> So yeah, man. So and this was some. Thank you, Lori. So the awesome. I thought you were saying waffles. I was like, we didn't have waffles, but she was saying raffle. Twenty-one years in the infantry, and then you know, guns and motorcycles. The waffles, right? We didn't have awesome waffles, but we did have an awesome raffle, right? So Willie had donated a couple shirts uh, the night before the pancake breakfast. And then that inspired me to sit there and, and get a couple coffee mugs and some t-shirts. And we went over to a thrift shop and we got some stuff and we put some raffle packets together. And that was really, uh, that really helped generate some, some money for those, those two individuals. So I think that's something that we're going to put in this sustain column, right? Like we're going to try to sustain that effort. So when we do the pancake breakfast and we, hey, we're not bashful about giving a business or a company or anybody, you know, props. If you want to donate something and have your business, you know, highlighted or talked about or whatever, it, it's it's a hand washing hand thing, right? So if you guys want to donate something for the next, um, not waffles, but the raffle for the pancake breakfast, not the waffle breakfast, uh, by all means, please do so, okay? Uh, I put these envelopes out there. And, uh, you know, just, just a reminder, if you guys want to tithe, tithe, don't let that be a barrier to your connection to the church, and don't let that be a barrier to your connection to God, right? But at the same time, if you want to tithe, we have a, a gas tank over there. Feel free to drop a donation in there. We got buckets over here. Feel free to drop it in there. Um, and if you want, you can put your name on it. And at the end of the year, Miss Helen does the tax piece. And she gives everybody um, uh, uh, a uh, roll up of all their donations for that year for their uh, tax purposes, okay? So, and if you haven't gotten your roll up and you want your roll up, talk to Miss Helen and she'll be more than happy to give it to you, all right? And last but not least, 38 days till bike week, all right? So, 38 days until, and I say bike week. I mean, to me, Bike Week starts when Willie has his chopper show, right, on Thursday, and it's all gas, no brakes until, uh, I don't know, Sunday morning, right? But uh, 38 days, plus or minus, so start your countdown, and that's it, man. So anyways, with that said, do me a solid look to your left, right, front, and back. Give your neighbor a howdy, a head nod, a handshake, fist bump. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. We're glad you're here. Love y'all. Woo! Thank you. This is a pen that's for your strength And my story isn't over The story's just begun There you want to find me That's what my father does There you want to find me Well
Father, we lift you high tonight because you're a worthy, worthy king. I'm grateful for what you do for us, Lord. God, let this not just be a time that we're singing songs, but let this be prayers coming to In your name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Well, good evening, everybody. Man, welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. I'll tell you what, ain't too many bikes out there. You know what? I don't care if he came on a bike. I don't care if he came in, in a car. I don't care if he came in a truck. Whatever, man. I'm just glad you're here. So uh, let's go ahead and open it up in, uh, in prayer. Father God, we love you and we praise you. Lord, I just pray tonight that you would teach us something. Lord, you would touch our hearts with your word and what you've prepared for us. 
Lord, help us to be the person you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a man and a woman had been married for more than 60 years, and they shared everything. They kept no secrets from each other except one thing. The old woman had a shoebox at the top of her closet that she had cautioned her husband never to open or to ask about. For all those years, the man never thought about the box. Until one day, the little old woman got very sick. And the doctor told her husband that she was not going to recover. So while he was trying to sort out their affairs, the little old man took down the shoebox and he took it to his wife's bedside. And she agreed that it was time that he should know what was in the box. When he opened it, he found two beautifully crocheted dolls and a stack of cash totaling $95,000. He asked his wife about the contents of the box. When we were engaged to be married, she said, my grandmother told me the secret of a happy marriage was never to argue. She told me that if I ever got angry with you, I should just keep quiet and crochet a doll. The little old man was extremely moved. He had to fight back the tears. Only two precious dolls were in the box. She had only been angry with him two times in all those years of their life together. He was almost bursting with love and happiness. Honey, he said, that explains the dolls, but what about all this money? Where did it come from? Oh, that? She said, that's the money I made from selling the dolls. She said, and, and by the way, I used the rest of it to put both of the kids through college. You like that one? Yeah, that's what happens when you wear glasses. You get better jokes. So, uh, so two weeks ago, we started a new series called, Am I Who God Wants Me to Be? And tonight, we're going to close out that series. We started out by talking about how most of us had dreams when we were kids about who or what we wanted to be. But for whatever reason, those dreams didn't come to fruition, right? For whatever reason, whatever we dreamed of being when we were younger changed over time. Maybe we wanted to be a professional athlete, but we weren't very fast. Or maybe we wanted to be an astronaut, but math just wasn't a subject that came naturally. And so we just kind of settled into who we are today. Maybe we think we're successful, maybe not. But regardless of what our level of success in life is, it never quite measures up to what our true potential is. Amen? I think most of us, if not all of us, would probably agree that we can do better. Right? We could do better in some areas of our lives. And we said that when you think about it, that's a lot like our walk as Christians. When we first became believers, we had dreams and ideas about what we could do for God, how he could use us for great things. But then, over time, we just kind of settled into who we are, right? And again, most of us, if not all of us, would probably agree that we could do better in some areas, amen? And after we talked about that, we talked about what God's expectation is for us. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. He's saying, I beg you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then 
You will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So that's what God expects of us. But if we're all honest with ourselves tonight, many of us are not living up to these expectations, right? Whether we're in here, whether we're online, we just don't quite measure up to that expectation. And just like with our dreams or our career aspirations, we're just not living up to our true potential as followers of Jesus Christ, right? Would you agree? Now, I don't know about you, but when I was young, I heard this a lot. Frankie, you're just not living up to your potential. Or how about this one? You know, Frankie, if you would just apply yourself, you might see what you're really capable of. Yeah, looking back though, I'm sure the people in my life who were telling me those things really meant well. They probably really meant well. I'm sure they were just trying to motivate me to try harder or to do better, but the truth is, I didn't care what my potential was, right? I wanted to just do the minimum to get by and spend all the extra time I had having fun, amen? I didn't want to be one of those nerds that did all their homework. I didn't want to be one of those guys that got all the answers right. So most of the time I skated by with, with B's and C's. I always got a D in math though, always. And I was lucky to get the D. I remember one time I sang to my teacher so she would pass me. You'd think that it would make her fail me, but you know. Anyway, every year, even though I got a D in math, my pop would make me go to summer school anyway so that I could get that grade up. And you know what, folks? The truth is I could have continued down that mediocre path my entire life. And if I had, I'd probably still be okay. You know, I'd be mediocre enough to make a living and, and still be able to do some of the things I wanted to do. But thankfully, when I was in the military, a commander of mine asked me a question that changed my life. Some of you have heard this story before, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. When I was in my late 20s, there was a Christian officer I knew that was my commander and he took an interest in my growth, not only as an airman, but as a Christian, because he was a strong Christian man. And one day over lunch, he asked me what my definition of success was. And I'd never been asked that question before. And I had to think about it. And the answer I came up with was nothing special. I think I mumbled something about making a good living and having a nice house and making my family proud. Something like that. But after I gave him my answer, he sent me off on a mission to see how the Apostle Paul defined success. I didn't know my Bible very well back then. So I spent a lot of time in my concordance. You guys familiar with your concordance it's at the back? And, and I, I spent a lot of time looking through the Bible and, you know, looking for clues as to what he's talking about. And then, after a while of searching, I found this passage. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul says, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And folks, for whatever reason, learning that definition... Paul's definition of, for success completely changed my definition of what success was. That's the point when, for the first time in my life, I started to care about reaching my potential. You see, I didn't really care what my teachers thought of me. I didn't care what my friends thought of me or my classmates or even what my parents thought of me. 
But if God is real, I did care what he thought of me, right? And for the first time in my life, I began to ask myself if I was becoming who God wanted me to be. And when you look at it from that perspective, it can change your entire life if you allow it to. You see, this is where the rubber meets the road, folks, of the Christian life. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is what the truth of our faith comes down to. Either we truly, honestly believe God is real and he is exactly who he says he is, or we don't. That's all there is to it. And if we believe it, and, and if he's real, then what it says in this book is important, right? You agree with that? And if what this says is true, then we have to do something about it, right? Because I don't know about you, but when I look around, the way I was living and the way this world is doesn't align with what it says in this book. Is it just me? Amen. Look, all of us might not be Billy Graham. We talked about him. But we'll never know unless we really, really give it our all. And as I said last week, we have to stop trusting in our boundary markers to show other people how strong of a Christian we are. And the boundary markers were the Christian symbols that we wear, right? And we, we put them on our, our car and we, we wear suits to church and we comb our hair just right and we, we wear our Bible up here. And we say, brother lot, right? Look, I don't care if you wear a huge cross around your neck, you have Jesus is my co-pilot bumper sticker on your car, and you carry your Bible wherever you go. If other people don't see a change or a difference in the way you live your life, then none of it matters. It doesn't mean jack. Last week, we said that when we trust in these boundary markers to demonstrate our faith, we are more damaged by our fake righteousness than sinners are of their sin. We think we're secure with God because we're more churched or more holy than other people. And if you remember, Jesus had a few things to say about these kind of people, right? In Matthew 23, Verses 1 through 3 says, Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. There's a lot of Christians that do that, amen? I'm not going to dwell on this, but I'm going to say it again. I believe this is a large part of why people reject the Christian church. It's not Jesus. Jesus is awesome. Nobody can argue with that. It's the way some of his followers behave, right? I heard a joke a long time ago. It said something like, God, forgive me, but more importantly, save me from your followers. Right? He continues, Jesus continued in verse 13. Listen to this. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? That's how you win friends. For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and when you turn that person into the twice the children of hell you yourselves are. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you. You say it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools. 
Which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? I could keep reading, but you get the point, don't you? He doesn't like these people. And you know what? We don't like these people. The truth is, when you see people that say one thing and do something completely different, you lose trust. trust. You, you lose all respect for them, right? I think you get the point, though. Jesus had nothing but disgust for these types of people. But unfortunately, many people that are inside the church are just like this. They feel confident because of their boundary markers. Everybody can see that I'm a Christian. Just look at the things I do. I'm such a good person, and I pray every day. You see me, right? You see how righteous I am? Blech. Right? We said last week that boundary markers aren't real change. They're nothing but religion. Following Christ is a transformational process. It's his power, not our own, that changes us. True transformation is through him, not through things we try and change about our lives to show others how religious we are. Right? I'm going to give you the same example that I gave you last week. Transformational change is like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Right? It doesn't happen overnight. Let's not settle for religious rituals or boundary markers. Religious rituals or boundary markers are like putting lipstick on a pig. Okay? Next slide. You can dress it up. You can put a wig on it. You can apply all the lipstick you want, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be a pig. Our potential as believers in the Lord Jesus is so much greater than religion. Listen to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when earthly things lurking in you, within you, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires, don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and all dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That's amazing potential, isn't it? Listen to me, folks. The only way that we are going to truly and honestly become the person that God wants us to be is by studying God's word, being around other Christians who are living the same life and rejecting sin, and a few other things we're going to get to. We're not supposed to be transformed into religious people. We're supposed to become new creations. And last week, we started talking about what it was going to take to do that. And we said the first thing we needed to do was give up control of our lives. To give ourselves over to him completely. Right? We talked about how that's really the toughest hurdle. Amen? Because we want to do what we want to do. I'm going to stop being cool if I follow God. Right? I'm going to have to go to church and learn those weird church songs and walk around and say brother all the time. I don't 
don't even like to wear suits. Right? Folks, God's not going to do that to you. But we have to give over control to him. You see, we want to drive. We want to drive. We want to be in the driver's seat, but we want Jesus to sit in the passenger seat in case we get pulled over. Okay? And then we want to say, hey, come on, man, tell him. Tell him who you are. But it doesn't work that way. We have to allow him to be in the driver's seat and stop following our sinful desires. We read from Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. As we said before, the end of this verse is, is specifically talking about money. But the beginning of this verse is the same regardless of what masters we're talking about, right? And what we're talking about tonight are God and our sinful nature. Two masters. And I'm sure we would all agree tonight that if we don't give ourselves to God, then our sinful nature will be our master because that's who it's been so far in our lives, even up to today, amen? And as you know, there is a battle going on in our minds and our hearts every day. But the truth is, how difficult the, the battle is depends on us. Because we choose what we're going to do each and every day. And if I don't know if you notice it or not, but the more you feed into something, the more it consumes you. You've heard it before, you know, you have two wolves living inside of you, right? Which one grows? The one you feed. And that's true in these two masters. So, last week I gave you a practical way of avoiding sin. Anybody remember what it was? Say it again. Acknowledge and move on. Acknowledge, move on, okay? We need to start recognizing the exact moments when we are faced with a sinful decision. And we know when that is. I don't care who you are. When you turn that channel on, oh, anybody watching? Right? We know when we're about to say something we shouldn't. Or we're about to do something that we shouldn't. I'm a, right? We know. So what we need to do is stop, acknowledge it, this is sinful, turn and go the other way. And if you remember the example I gave you was when you walk in the house or you go in the garage and you hear your spouse screaming four letter words at something or someone, what do you do? You go the other way. If you're smart, right? You don't walk into that situation, hey. Of course, our spouses don't use four-letter words. Those are other people. But listen, folks, we need to learn to do the same thing with sin. But it can't. It's just too hard. No, it's not. Not if we have the Holy Spirit. It's not hard. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. Acknowledge. Move on. Okay? Are you with me? Anybody try that this week? Anybody? Anybody? Not one person. Thanks. Appreciate it. Oh, this is fantastic. When you see sin, listen to me. When you see sin, look at it and say, hey, that's going to get me in trouble. Right? That's going to get me in trouble. Turn and go the other way. And you know what? It works. Uh-huh. Of evil, that's right.
Yeah. All appearances of evil, right? If it looks like it's going to get you in trouble, it is. Right? Acknowledge, move on. Now, since you listened so well to that last one, the last thing that we're going to talk about tonight is the final piece of this series, okay? If we can avoid sin, we stay in the Word, and we get a firm handle on this next part, we will become the person God wants us to be. We will. So, quick reminder. We need to push away the boundary markers. It was our proof of faith. And surrender to God. Put him in the driver's seat. This is what begins the transformation. The second part comes through the renewal of our minds. This happens with studying the scriptures, attending church with other believers, and rejecting and avoiding sin. So what's the last piece of the puzzle? What's the one thing that takes us over the top and enables us to become the person that God wants us to be? Are you ready? You ready? Good. You know I'm not going to tell you yet. How long have you been coming to this church? i got to give you a story. What do you mean, oh, no? I think what you meant was amen, right? Next slide. Vera Baker started dating James Gator Leggett when they were 20 years old. Vera's brother, Bert, warned her of Leggett's violent temper. But Vera was in love and ignored the warning. Bert recalls he could be very pleasant and very likable, but five minutes later, something could kind of start to set him off. When James eventually asked Vera to marry him, her family wasn't too excited, especially Jesse, Vera's dad, who was a devoted Christian and Methodist pastor. When my daughter was walking down the aisle, my thoughts were, Lord, protect her. Jesse says, we knew James had a violent temper, and we knew it was going to be kind of rough. Not too long after the wedding, Vera told her brother about the bruises from the times when James would beat her. Bert says, there were a few on her legs, there were some on her back. After three years of marriage, Vera separated from James and filed for divorce. Bert remembers what happened next. After the divorce became final, she called me and said that James had beat her. So I grabbed a baseball bat and a 12-gauge shotgun, and I went over to her house. James never showed up that night, and Bert eventually went home. Two days later, James shot his ex-wife six times. The doorbell rang. Jesse said there were two policemen. They said, your daughter lives in Jacksonville, right? Her name is Vera Bell or Vera Baker. I said, yes, she's been killed. I just stood there in disbelief. Then we put our arms around each other and cried and cried. And then we thought of Bert. Bert says, my First reaction was I ran out to the driveway. I was just so angry about the situation that I fell to my knees and I beat my head against the concrete. I blamed myself because I didn't do something about it the day before. I felt that I needed to go find James, and when I found him, I was going to kill him. Bert never got his chance. Police soon arrested James, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison for murder. He would be eligible for parole after 20 years. Bert was already making plans for the day James would get out of prison. I made his release date my ATM PIN number so that every time I got money out of the bank, I would remember that that's the day, Bert said. That's when he gets out, and that's when I'm going to find him. After 15 years in prison, something changed for James. He says, that's when God come to me, and he started dealing with my heart. I told God, you got a good talk game, 
talking about you love me, that your son died for me on the cross. I told God, where was you at when my dad died? God just kept showing his love on me for the next seven days as the Holy Spirit started pointing different issues out and started purging me. I cried for seven straight days as the Holy Spirit would bring different things to me. I accepted Christ into my life. I repented, and that's what the seven days was about. He gives me the peace that surpasses all understanding. After asking God to forgive him, James wondered if his ex-wife's family ever could. He knew he had to ask by writing them a letter. He says, I basically asked them to forgive me for the horrible act that I committed against their family, for the pain and the loss of their beautiful daughter, Vera. James's ex-wife's parents only had one response, Jesse said. I laid the burden down and said, James, I forgive you for murdering Vera. It was based on the scripture that's found in Luke 23, 34, where Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'd been angry long enough. It was time to get rid of that anger. It was time to honor her memory. Then they showed the letter to Bert and asked him if he would forgive James. Bert, who had plotted revenge for years, finally started to soften to the idea of forgiveness. Bert says, as I finished the letter, I went outside and ended up in the driveway again. This time I looked up and told God, okay, God, you win. I forgive James Leggett. I even told the people in my Bible study class what I had done when God told me what to do. I had forgiven James, but I didn't have to eat dinner with him. In 2002, James was released from prison after serving 20 years. He started working in prison ministry just as Bert had. They both remember the day they saw each other for the first time in 20 years. Bert says he dropped his head almost as if in shame. When he did that, it gave me confirmation that he was truly sorry. Bert looked at me, James said. He just told me it's been a long time coming. At that point, I knew Bert had forgiven me. Today, Bert and James faithfully served together in prison ministry. These days, I can eat dinner with James and know that the man sitting across the table from me is one of my brothers, Bert said. He's someone that I love and someone that loves me. We are no longer prisoners of the unforgiveness that we felt. Folks, that is a true story. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to understand that kind of love. And going through something like Bert and his family went through is not the way I want to learn about it. But folks, that's the key ingredient to becoming who God wants us to be. Love. That is the key to reaching our true potential in Christ. It's so simple to think about, right? But when you look at it in this context, it's not so simple. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud rude, it does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. You know, that passage is usually read at weddings about how a husband and wife should treat one another. But, folks, the truth is this isn't just for husbands and wives. This is how we're supposed to treat one another. This is how we're supposed to be as followers of Christ. To have love like that and to become the person God wants us to be, we have to give him the keys. 
We have to yield our hearts to him and surrender to his purposes for our lives. And you know what? It's not an easy process. It's not. For a caterpillar to become a butterfly, there's something special that has to happen. But it doesn't happen overnight. Each of our walks with Christ are different, and we will transform at our own rate. But listen, if we never surrender, if we never really look at this as the Word of God, if we never believe He's really there, the process never starts. It never starts. And regardless of how long we sit in a church pew, or how many prayers we say, without a heart change, and without Jesus' love in our heart, we are not going to change. And if we don't change, then this is the best we have. We better just settle for those boundary markers to show other people that we're good Christians. Instead of Christ's love showing through us. Coming to church and identifying as a Christian is great. But it's not the end of who God wants us to be. Part of the problem in our country is Christians aren't who they're supposed to be. The church is not a museum where you put up works of art. The church is like a hospital where you bring sick people. It's okay if you're sick. This is where you're supposed to come. You see, wherever you are in your walk with Jesus today, and how much, however much you allow him to guide your life or, or don't guide your life, it's fine. It's fine. But the problem is, if you stay that way, if you're not becoming more like Jesus, then something's wrong, right? It's okay for you to be where you're at, but it's not okay for you to stay that way. Amen? Amen? Folks, we don't look at it that way. If this is real, we have to do something, right? We have to live differently. We have to act differently. If we take people to the hospital, we expect them to get better, right? We don't drop them off and go, well, sucks for you. See you next week. We expect them to get better after the surgery or the illness. And listen, although we will never quite shake the illness of sin completely, it can definitely get better. Maybe we can put in a remission the sin that we have in our lives, amen? I hear that uh, pancreatic cancer is, uh, is a death sentence. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, it's in remission, right? Amen. I don't know, folks. Maybe it's possible. You see, coming to church and doing good things for God doesn't matter at all if it's not done out of love. If it's not done because of who he is. No matter what we do, it's for, if it's for the sake of religion, might as well stay home. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says this. Listen to this. Without love, none of it matters. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others... I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. You guys understand what I'm teaching tonight? This is the end of this series. The question is, are we becoming the person that God wants us to be? That's up to us. 
He's not going to drag you kicking and screaming. It's a choice. And I believe love is the key. And it's hard to love other people that you don't even like. It's hard to love people like me. I promise you. Folks, if you haven't listened to anything I've said tonight, listen to this. Being a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ is more than just going to heaven. When we accept Christ and we yield our lives to him, we follow his teachings, he will change our hearts and we will become more like him. And that's the point. And as we continue to conform to his image, then sin is no longer our master. I don't know about you, but I know what it felt like. I remember what it felt like when sin was my master. I felt horrible. I always had a pit in my stomach. Always waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? I felt like, you ever got oil on your hand and you can't get it off? Well, I felt like that all over. Like it was in my ears and it was in my teeth. And I, I would try to get it off and it just, I couldn't get clean, right? But then... When I confessed Christ, I did it for selfish reasons. I did it because I needed the fire insurance. I just wanted to go to heaven. All right? But over time, the oil started to come off. Over time, the less I played in the oil, the cleaner I got. And the further it got away from my lives, the happier I was. It's almost like this is real. It's almost like there really is a God. It's almost like he's up there figuring it all out. And if we do what he says, things fall into place. Holy cow! But folks... It's a choice. It's a choice. Do we want to continue down a mediocre path, just getting by on C's and D's? Or do we want to get A's because our Heavenly Father can give us what we need to do it? That's the question. So tonight, if you've never accepted Christ, if you don't know who he is, I've got good news for you. They actually call it the good news. It's hilarious. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody here tonight. Maybe in the nicer churches that comes as a surprise, but not at Biker Church, right? Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to come up before church. You don't have to go to Africa. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You just have to pray to God that he saves you and changes you and becomes Lord of your life. And I promise you, things will not stay the same as long as you seek him. If you're here tonight and you want to accept Christ, we're here for you. If you're here tonight and you just want a do-over, Remember when we were kids and we got a do-over? I love that. We break it, we trash it, we do-over. Folks, his mercies are new every morning, is what scripture teaches us. 
we can leave out of here different than when we came in, but it's up to us. If you need prayer tonight, I'm going to be up here while Brian plays. I'll happily pray with you. And then after that, we're going to do some prayer requests. So as Brian plays, I'm going to be up here. Come up if you need me. church. Let's gather our faith together and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, Father. We thank you for Pastor Frankie's message, God. I know it went straight to the heart for many of us. Thank you for that, Lord. Father, we are lifting up tonight healing prayers for Cochise, God. We pray that you would give him strength, that you would heal his body, God, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, Lord. We're praying for Hammer, God. He needs an absolute divine miracle, much like what you've done for our friend Jim. He needs healing. He needs a complete miracle from cancer, God, but we know that you're able, so we declare healing, complete healing over our friend Hammer in Jesus' name. Father, we're praying for Eric Martin tonight. His uncle Greg is being taken off uh, life support this evening. Um, Hannah and Quinn, their father Jeff, he's in his last days due to cancer. So, Father God, we lift their families up to you, God. We pray for a peaceful transition. We pray for understanding, that you would just make sense out of some of these questions that might be there, God, that you would just bring peace to that family, comfort to that family, um, just Holy Spirit wisdom and understanding. Father, we're lifting up to you the Fields family. We're lifting up to you Elaine. Lord, you know everything that's happening in, in those lives. Um, God, we pray for wisdom, for understanding, for the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit to make decisions. God, we pray for your favor in their situations. And tonight, God, we want to declare Second Corinthians and Ephesians 1 over our brothers and sisters, God, that need strength this evening. We declare, may the God of all comfort bring comfort to you in your troubles. May our glorious Father give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and may the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you may know the hope in which he called you, that he will work strength in you by his mighty power. And we have a, a praise report just thanking you, Lord, for all the wonderful things that you've done in this individual's life. And I come along and I agree with that, God. And we thank you for the testimonies of healing that we've heard from cancer, the miracles, God, salvations, the healing from COVID, the healing from deliverance, God, that word testimony in the Hebrew, that word means do it again. And we heard Pastor Frankie declare that, do over, just do it again. So God, those miracles, those healings, those salvations, those deliverances that, if, that our brothers and sisters have already experienced, we speak those again in the name of Jesus and say, do it again, do it again, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jen. So there's a uh, there's a man in Scripture that was blind, and Jesus healed him. And I said, tell me about this guy, Jesus. Tell me about this guy, Jesus. That, that He said, look, I don't know a lot about this guy, Jesus. But I know this. Ah. 
have to know the whole Bible to be a beacon of hope for other people. We just have to know our own story. And I pray as we go out into the community this week that we would be salt and light and that people would see Jesus in us. I love all you.